All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Blockchain Basics, Introduction to the Technology. My name is Benjamin Schaub, and I'm a project manager at the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center. With me today is Stefan Schmidt. He's a colleague of mine from the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center as well, and he will give the presentation in a few minutes. Before uh, we start, let me give you a quick overview of today's agenda. So I'll briefly introduce the project Blockchairs. Uh, this is why we are here today. And then Stefan will hold his presentation for roughly 30 minutes. And afterwards, we will have a Q&A for 15 minutes. I will moderate your questions from the chat box and uh, Stefan will provide answers. So I can only strongly encourage you right now to ask questions also during the session. And this can easily be done in Zoom if you use the chat box. All right, let's talk a bit about blockchains for a moment. This project is funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Framework Program. And the project itself, blockchains, focuses on the implementation of blockchain use cases. The goal is to match startups um, that have the technological know-how um, with small and medium-sized enterprises that could benefit from the application of blockchain or DLT solutions, but they do not really understand the benefits of the technology or they do not have the know-how or don't have the, the budget. So the overall go goal is to gain insights in the implementation of use cases in blockchain and then see what works in which framework and what doesn't. And with all the learnings, we will provide a policy recommendation at the end of the project for the European Union. So how does the project work? There have been two open calls um, where interested startups were able to send their proposals, including um, the use case they would like to implement. And then the best startups will receive funding. And this depends on certain factors, for example, like the business case, or this can be the blockchain expertise, and also the quality of the counterpart SME the startup is working with. And the second call just recently finished, and we had 111 proposals from 27 countries, which is quite a success for us. So what happens if, uh, when we receive a proposal, uh, the proposals get evaluated? Um, again, as I said, uh, this depends on certain factors. And then the best up to 18 projects from each call, we had two calls, and they advance to the immersion phase. And in the immersion phase, there is a pitch contest, a pitch evaluation also. And then the winners from this phase move up to the implementation phase. And in, during the implementation phase, um, we develop certain KPIs the startups have to fulfill. And the funding then depends on the fulfillment of these KPIs. And in the end, um, we, the best two startups will receive a prize, which means that the funding for a startup can be up to 50K Euro in total. A few words about the involved partner companies. We have Zabala, it's a Spanish SME. They are very experienced in the management of innovation activities. Then we have Innomine, it's an innovation management and innovation funding expert from Hungary. We have Alastria, it's a consortium um, with members um, in all industries in Spain. They support a project with a semi-public uh, blockchain or DLT infrastructure. And last but not least, um, there's the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center. And our task is to provide the SMEs with uh, technical and business insights in blockchain technology. And for this, we designed and developed the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center Academy. So far, we have seven courses online. Six of them are in English. One is in German. We have great speakers from various industries. Each course has around four hours of video content and additional literature. And um, of course, these courses include a certificate of participation. 
Um, if you look at the courses we designed so far, we have um, on a, like a as a platform course to to start your knowledge from the blockchain basics course to to gain some knowledge on the topic. This is where Stefan comes in as he will provide um, insights from this course in a few minutes. And then uh, we one could say we have a technical track and a strategic track. And the technical track includes the architecture of enterprise and public blockchains and cryptography for block blockchain. And then on the strategic track, we have um, topics like tokenization, uh, blockchain adoption, innovation, and regulation. And again, blockchain use cases, identification, implementation. So this was my part. Um, before we start, just a few words about Stefan Schmidt. As I said, he works as a project manager for the Franco School Blockchain Center. And he's also a project manager at ITSA, that's the International Token Standardization Association. Also, what is quite nice, as I already said, he's the product owner of the Frankfurt School Blockchain Academy. So, Stefan, the stage is yours. All right. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. And I hope that my presentation is now going. Yes, it is. So welcome from my side as well. My name is Stefan Schmidt. And as Benjamin already said, we are colleagues at the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center. We work together at Blockchairs. And I also lead the Blockchain Academy, which is our education part. Um, I consider this webinar um, being part of our education that we offer. However, Please note for, as I have seen some names that I recognize, please note this really is um, aimed at beginners, um, giving you a basic idea what blockchain is um, to, to follow the news and to learn on your own. There's a lot of great sources to learn on yourself online. And I think um, with that, let's get started. So uh, with that being said, if you think after this webinar, oh, I knew all of that stuff already, um, Please don't be mad, be, be uh, proud of yourself that you are somewhat familiar with blockchain already. So this is the three things I want to talk about. Um, as you might have read, I said, I want to answer really three questions. Um, what is blockchain or what is the value blockchain provides? So this is supposedly the motivation why people engage with this technology. Then the theory, how does blockchain work? Um, I think, I could easily talk about this for hours. Um, we only will have maybe seven, eight minutes. As you can see, this, this won't be enough time to really explain the technology, but maybe give you an idea how, how to deal with the buzzwords, what a hash is, what a node is, and how um, things are working, and give you a basic understanding. And then we come to the maybe more exciting part, the application, how does blockchain work in reality? So how are people? I'm using the technology today. And for that, I took or selected five companies, um, most of them actually based in Frankfurt or people um, being from Frankfurt um, because they are close to the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center um, because I know them personally. And I will give you some insights what they do with the technology. And I think um, if this is maybe one of your first touch points with blockchain, looking at some of these applications will really help you a lot. It helped me out a lot um, because then you see a real life application of the technology and can ask um, why does it need to be blockchain? Um, how do the strength of the blockchain technology really bring this use case to life? And so these are the three um, yeah, points we are going to tackle. So let's get started really slowly with uh, blockchain. I would say these three pictures represent how most people know of blockchain. Um, the first on the left is obviously the um, Bitcoin white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2009. Uh, Bitcoin being the leading cryptocurrency by market capitalization um, today as well. So you can think of it whatever you want. Uh, I myself am really critical of it, but it proved to work for at least 11 years without major problems. Then in the middle, we have the total market capitalization of all cryptocurrencies or tokens, cryptographic tokens combined. And as you can see, um, in 2017, everything really accelerated, got to a peak, and then we had the 
crash, the crypto winter. And I think in that time, a lot of people associated blockchain with cryptocurrencies, with speculation, and a lot of people also lost faith in the technology. Um, on the other hand, I would say a lot of malicious um, players or people that just got into blockchain because of greed um, dropped out. So this might be a good thing. And then lastly, Libra, um, with Libra 2.0 um, being around now, this is uh, more up-to-date than ever. However, when you look at these three things, the main touch points for all people coming to this technology, um, you will realize most of them will think blockchain is about payments. Um, blockchain is about creating digital currencies. And this is partly true, but the technology is so much more. Luckily, in the last years, or no, not really more like in 2019, the technology got some more attention. As you will recognize this man, uh, Xi Jinping, um, the head of China, if you want, um, talked about blockchain, I think, in October or November, um, had a great address and said that the technology is to be taken seriously. And China was already leading in blockchain, but I think at that point they um, really doubled down and uh, moved forward with really high speed. Um, I think this is nothing to be uh, frightened of. We can see that we have like three blockchain hubs, um, the Americas, uh, Europe, and uh, Asia, of course. And I think here in Germany, um, we can be really proud that even though we live in a country which I would say is um, a little hesitant, doesn't like to take too much risk, and is behind in a lot of technology um, developments, um, we are pretty progressive when it comes to blockchain. So the German government released its blockchain strategy, I think somewhere around August last year, and um, wants to enable the token economy. And um, with that, the Ministry of Finance also said they want to enable um, tokenized equity, tokenized shares. And this is something that we will um, talk about a little more uh, later on. But as you can see, um, Germany really is, at least in Europe, uh, front-running when it comes to regulation, when it comes to setting a framework. And this is one of the reasons why a lot of um, really promising blockchain projects are from Germany and when it comes to finance, um, obviously from Frankfurt. But now let's get deeper into it. And I want to um, quickly look at a concept we call Internet of Value. And these uh, ugly text boxes are soon to disappear. And so uh, you will see four pictures soon, and we will um, look at speed, cost, size, and security each time. And what we really want to talk about to, to highlight the value proposition that blockchain is, um, is a comparison to the internet, how the internet changed, um, how we deal with information, how we send and receive information, how we store them, and what blockchain and the internet can do for value. And for that, we start with a post box. And um, as you can see, it says Lierung täglich, so um, it's empty daily. I think this seems to be pretty fast. Um, I don't use mail that much anymore. But uh, this was really the standard, let's say, 50 years ago or even 20 years ago. And now, um, what information can we deduct from this picture? If you want to send information using a letter, um, it will at least take you one or two days. If you send a postcard somewhere from a small island in Thailand to um, your relatives here in Germany or somewhere else around the world, it might even take two, three or four weeks. So it depends and it's rather slow. Um, when it comes to cost, the setup cost is really low. Um, you just need a pen, but you will always need some paper. You need an envelope, you need a stamp. So every information you send will cost you money. If you look at the size of the information you could get into um, this envelope, uh, it really depends on your envelope, right? Um, you could maybe send a postcard. You could maybe stuff three, four pages of paper into an envelope. If you want to send a contract, you need a bigger envelope. If you want to send um, really goods, you need packages. And uh, cost will increase. And security, and this is really um, one of the important points when we talk about blockchain later on, um, there is a single point of failure, or in this case, a lot of single point of failures where everything could go wrong for you. Um, think of the Christmas season. In the Christmas season, a lot of um, post uh, disappears or a lot of mail disappears because uh, sweet grandmas send money to their children um, in envelopes and 
yeah, for some reason they disappear. So along all the distribution way, um, if you let it disappears, it's gone. If the um, post box is set on fire, it's gone. Um, so the security is really low. It's really easy to attack the mail. Um, and all this changed drastically with the internet. Now, I think I should have taken maybe a little more yeah, up-to-date picture. This more looks like um, 1995. However, you get the idea with um, email when we look at our four, uh, four characteristics. Um, it's really fast. You can send messages all over the world within seconds. Um, it's really cheap. Nearly everyone has access to a phone or a computer. Um, there's no setup cost for Google Mail and it literally costs you nothing or at most your internet fees. Um, and what's really interesting is the size. So you can send more or less anything. You can send a simple okay as an answer or you could attach 10 books. Um, you can send a link to a video. You can copy and distribute more or less all information that are digital now. And this is an important point we come back to as well. So being able to take one file and make it accessible to millions of people. And when it comes to security, I think I, I don't want to go into that too much. Um, but what we can see here, because security right, uh, depends a lot on, on which service are you using. Um, Anyways, let's stick with Google Mail. If one of their data centers burns down, um, maybe your message takes a second longer to be sent, um, but it's really hard to, to stop your message from being sent. So in the sense, getting the information through is uh, pretty likely. And now from information, we move to value. Um, this is the money we use today. Um, earlier, we might have used more coins um, than other stuff. Um, we also have digital money in a sense that all of us have at least one, two, maybe three, four cards. And now if we look at what we said before um, at the attributes, um, we will see that, let's say, speed of a transaction. If we take paper money, um, we have to be present. We have to be face-to-face um, -face with the um, person we are paying or we're receiving money from because um, yeah, otherwise it won't work. Um, if we take digital money, if you want to send uh, money from one bank account to another. It might go instantaneously. Um, there we see some improvements, but really if you uh, send money to a friend or relative, let's say in Iran, in America, and wherever in a different country, it will most likely take you days. Um, and there is quite some cost attached to it. I guess about cost when it comes to paying, we cannot say much. Um, however, security is really interesting. Um, currently, we rely on a banking system, and just to make sure, I don't will make the argument that blockchain will um, render all the financial sector obsolete. I think this is um, nonsense, but it will help transform the financial sector, and we will get to that. So, um, banks today rely on data security. Obviously, they have their uh, big data center, and how data security is built, it's usually as soon as you get in, you're in. So they make it hard to, to, for intruders to get in. They have a lot of walls built around their data center. Um, and this is your single point of failure again. So as soon as someone can breach the security, uh, the data can be um, altered. And even though this might be restored easily, uh, it can lead to a, a critical loss of trust of the customers. Blockchain, however, um, yeah, works differently. With blockchain, you don't necessarily need an intermediary like a bank to transfer value digitally, um, right? Before I said, uh, if you want to pay with bills, you have to be face-to-face. -face. Um, if you want to pay digitally, you have to use a bank because the bank, um, both of you trust the bank and the bank updates the accounts. So if I send 50 euros to Benjamin, they will deduct 50 from my um, account and add it to his. Without this intermediary, um, we have one critical problem that comes along with the internet um, that I highlighted before, you can easily give thousands of people access to one file, but it's really hard or nearly impossible to um, send one file over so that you don't own it anymore. 
as if I were to give uh, Benjamin 50 euros in reality, I wouldn't have them anymore. Um, he would. To do the same thing digitally is really, really hard. And this is where blockchain technology comes in because blockchain with the architecture underlying enables peer-to-peer -peer transactions and um, change of ownership of values of all kinds. This could be money. Um, we will later maybe see it could be shares, it could be real estate, it could be parts of Da Vinci, um, it could be a lot of stuff. And um, now as we are here with money, if we look at payments, we can get some of the problems that we have with uh, traditional money out of the way. Uh, really uh, transactions can happen all over the world um, within seconds uh, with nearly no cost attached, really secure. And um, maybe when we talk about the size characteristic, it could be almost any asset that you can now send over the internet. Um, and maybe even in five years, when we look at this part, maybe you can just attach 50 euros um, in an email or uh, on any other platform and send it. And so this is really what the blockchain technology promises, um, an internet of value, value transfers, digital values. So now we come to the second part, and uh, I think I have to hurry up a little, but just a little, and we start with the um, theory or the technical part. So this is a, let's say, a buzzword or word cloud that I created, and these are really just um, blockchain buzzwords that come to mind when I think, uh, brainstorm for one minute. Um, and maybe a lot of you have seen, read, heard most of these words, however, I myself had my difficulties um, getting my head around it and really understanding what is what. And so blockchain technology really is uh, difficult to get into. However, I have uh, one very simplified example, so please don't be offended by that, um, which I think conveys the, the basic message what blockchain is. And so we will start with that. And here we have the card game called Uno. Um, I guess most of you will be familiar with it, um, either because maybe you're younger and still play cards or because you're older and have kids and play cards with them. And so what we can see here, and just to make an important differentiation, um, first I thought about using poker because poker, I think, um, appeals to a lot of people. But with poker, you have a dealer, you have like an intermediary, you have a bank. Here you have see uh, three people playing a game of cards. Um, no oversight. They set the rules, um, they agree to the rules, and um, they uh, control each other that the rules um, are not broken. And some of the rules would be um, you can put a six on a six, you can put a blue card on a blue card, and whatever is on the cards, right? And um, as the game progresses, they will um, stack the cards, and so this is really transparent. And now let's look at what this could look like as a blockchain. As you can see here, the, um, the cards um, that the people play would be the blockchain, um, because a blockchain really, in a really, really simple way, is like a register or a um, transaction trail. So it shows you um, all the transactions in the order that they happened. Um, it gives you an idea when which was done and always in the same order, in one correct order, so it gives you um, good transparency what happened in the past. And this transparency, um, where well, this is an important feature we will see later on. And now um, the security of blockchain is somewhat, of course, these are only three nodes, right? So three network participants, three people, um, having decentralized control because they control each other. And as soon as two or three um, agree to something, this is the truth. And um, as you would hope that people act truthfully, um, this is also the truth that will be stored in the blockchain. Um, further information. What we can see, um, I said the cards are the blocks. In every card, there is some information stored. In that uh, case, it would be the color and the sort of the card. Is it a number? Is it an action card? And um, now let's maybe take a look at a transaction and I think then you will clearly understand why I took this uh, metaphor. 
Here you will see that um, for a sample blockchain transaction, um, first one of the nodes requests a transaction. This would be if one of the players um, plays a card and um, before the next player plays, um, even though you know in our world we are much faster because we know the rules, um, but when I play a card and I play with two of you, both of you will check if what I did was um, okay or if I broke rules. If I broke rules, you will tell me no, this is not happening. Um, if you say yes, this is fine, um, then you validate my move, my transaction, and it goes on. So this is really what happens. The transaction is sent to the other nodes in the network is me playing a card. You look at the card, um, means you check, um, did I uh, break some rules? For example, did I try to um, send my one Bitcoin that I own two times? Um, if so, you would say, sorry, Stefan, you don't have that much money. Um, this transaction will not work. However, if you give your check mark, say um, it does, um, this transaction is um, stored in a block. And uh, when I first thought about it, I looked at dice, right? Um, a die has six sides. And so if you want, let's say you can put exactly six transactions in a block and then it's done. Um, this was a really simple way for me to think about it because I said now all sides are filled and now I need a new block, now I need a new blank die. And um, as soon as the block is full of transactions, it's finished and appended to the blockchain network. And what is important here, uh, when you compare it to how well you, digital well use function today, um, a bank will just alter your or edit the values in your bank account in a blockchain that doesn't work, or at least in, the, in how it's supposed to be in most um, architectures. Let's say, I think you can see my mouse, this is the first block, and then it goes on and on and on. This is what I said, the blockchain gives you transparency and clear information of the time when which transaction was done. Because you can say this block was 20 minutes ago, this was 10 minutes ago, this is now. And when you want to find out um, your bank account's balance, you can just look at it um, because it's altered. Here it would work like this. Maybe in this block I have, let's say, 10 euros. Here I received 10 euros. And here I spent 20 euros. And um, before the information lands here, right, at the, here I say I want to spend 20 euros, the people, the validators, look at it, and they will go through the blockchain and see, all right, plus 10, plus 10, all right, Stefan's um, balance actually is 20. So um, to, to get a balance, you need this whole ledger um, that you can always go through the audit trail that is um, transparent. And uh, one of the other features that is often talked about is the immutability of blockchain. It's also immutable in a sense, as soon as one of these blocks is finished and the next one is created, um, the data is stored and it's not supposed to be edited um, ever. Obviously, if you overtake the network, you could um, undertake that and try to um, alter the data, uh, but this will probably not really work out. Um, of course, security um, on blockchain, it's, it's an interesting topic. Um, if you look at the Bitcoin blockchain, it's really robust. Um, to hack that is, um, I would say, nearly impossible because um, and to break it down, you would need let's say 50 plus X percent um, or 50.1 percent of the computing power and that would be uh, so so expensive for you um, just to ruin a cryptocurrency and overtaking it that will have no value afterwards. So blockchains have um, uh, different setups when it comes to security to consensus um, but here you can see um, why it's called blockchain because it's a chain of blocks. Each block um, holds transactions and they are uh, sorted um, by time. And the transparency of the whole audit trail um, it will give you exact, uh, um, an exact, uh, and re uh, excuse me, um, a good de depiction um, or exact depiction what, uh, who owns. And this also solved the problem. So now, um, you know, I said we send digital values uh, when I talked about the internet of value. Here, now it's possible for me to own one Bitcoin and send it to someone else. And when I send it, um, it's gone from me. I don't own it anymore. I don't possess it anymore. I cannot send it twice. Um, this will 
be recognized here. So um, here in this graph or with the uh, UNO example combined, you can see why blockchain enables the internet of value. Well, now coming back to the uh, buzzword cloud, I think we talked about quite some things. Um, what you could do, um, one, we will upload this uh, webinar anyways. What you can do as well is maybe take a screenshot. I tried to uh, put some order into the bus, uh, buzzword cloud. Obviously, there's so much more things that you could talk about, but um, I think really um, looking at um, the protocols architecture is one of the most interesting things because you will look at control. Control means um, who is able to uh, put data in a block to validate transactions. And permission means who can see what, uh, which is really interesting as well for companies because they might have data privacy concerns. And um, with permission, you could more or less control who gets in. It's like a bouncer, who gets in and who gets to see what and the consensus mechanism um, because a lot of people still think when they hear blockchain they think of bitcoin and they say wow bitcoin takes as much energy the bitcoin protocol as austria um, which is true which i find really sad but it is how it is but this is really the energy consumption is what makes bitcoin secure um, but there's not just proof of work if you look into it there's um, proof of stake proof of authority delegated proof of stake um, a lot of other things and i think most blockchains really um, are most different when you look at their architecture, when you look at control, permission, and consensus. So when you look at the, these three things, you will get a feeling for the blockchain protocol and um, maybe how it is useful where others are not. Um, yes, I would advise you to do that. And I think with this, I come to the um, conclusion of the theoretical part. As I said, um, if you want to talk about all of this, Actually, we have a course called Blockchain Basics on it. Um, and I think going through all the buzzwords took at least two, two and a half hours and you could go far more in depth. Um, but uh, one last thing that you should uh, never um, miss, and this is why we come now to the uh, applications of blockchain. Um, one early mistake that a lot of companies did, I think, um, these are all blockchain startups, right? Um, maybe except Marco Polo. Um, uh, problems that these people did when they explained what they are doing is that they talk too much about blockchain. Um, besides for the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center, I have advised and worked for several other startups. And I think um, the most important learning is that you use the word blockchain, um, yeah, not too often, maybe two, three times. Um, because blockchain really is what makes these use cases um, work. But it's like an engine in a car. You don't have to understand the engine um, for the car to work. Obviously, you have to trust that the engine works. Um, but when you look at blockchain, I think first you should really look at use cases, um, see what the technology enables. Then you can ask yourself, and I think this really looking at use cases will help you learn tremendously because then, you can ask yourself, why is blockchain used? Maybe why is Ethereum better here than protocol X, Y? Why do you need a private blockchain? And so on and so forth. Um, and after that, I think really understanding blockchain really deep, um, talking about hashes, talking about the cryptography aspects, Merkle trees, whatever. Um, these are not topics that you need to understand now or that you would need to understand soon. Um, for example, if you work for um, a company that thinks about working together with a blockchain startup, um, really what should get you first is their use case. Then you should check if it's legally possible. And then I guess you have an IT department, some tech specialists that can look into the tech and say, does this um, work or not? Um, does this have the security standards that we want or not? So really um, just look at some of these examples. I know I've been talking for 28 minutes now. I think Benjamin was a little faster, so I will keep talking um, on for maybe five, six minutes before we come to an end. Um, and let's start with tokenization. So what is tokenization? Um, yeah, token in German would be a Wertmarke, so a store of value. Um, and here it's a digital store of value. And um, we, we like to look at it as an empty container 
or actually who really likes to look at it like this is um, the government of Liechtenstein. And um, you could put in this container whatever you want, right? For example, and what CacheLink does, um, apart from other things, right? I, I just want to highlight one of their things, and this is true for all companies. Um, if you're more interested, look at that, uh, look at their homepages directly or get in touch. Um, what they do, they tokenize um, equity. And to make it simple, if you, have a, you are the owner of a private company, let's say you have 100 employees, um, but you are not publicly uh, listed or traded, and you need some more liquidity. And you don't want to go through debt, but through equity. And now it's really a pain because um, you need an investment round, you need to go to the uh, notary. Um, it's a long process and it costs you quite some, quite some money as well. Um, what you can do now is, for example, give out virtual shares more or less and trade them. And basically what CashLink begin with was um, a token that would give you a share in a company, even though it's not a, a publicly listed company, um, part of their equity, but equity without voting rights. So if you want, um, that would mostly be, I think it's called preference shares or a class B shares in the in the um, stock world. And with that, they enable um, private companies to get liquidity through equity. Um, and I think in the future, they will be able to tokenize whatever, maybe real shares, maybe bonds. Um, it's a really interesting thing to think about. And um, it's also really interesting um, because these private companies, and we will see this with RTX as well, um, <clears throat> their equity is really illiquid, right? If you are invested in one of these companies, getting rid of your share um, won't be that easy because there's no secondary market for it. Um, what CashLink now does with these tokens, you could invest maybe some hundred euros in a private company, which would never be possible before, and you can um, trade it on a marketplace or exchange. And um, we will see this with tokenization in general. It will bring liquidity to markets which have been really illiquid before. And I think this is a good thing. Um, and let's go to RTX 21. Um, I don't really want to go too deep into what they do exactly, but uh, more or less it's the same idea as cashling, but not with equity of companies, but with real estate. And for example, if you think of the market for um, private property, so family houses and whatever, um, how do these owners, the private owners, um, get money out of their real estate? Um, they can go to the bank and uh, get a, a mortgage on it, and that's more or less it. And um, with tokenization of real estate, what you could do is, A, enable fractional ownership. This means, um, for example, with if I wanted to say, um, I want a diversified portfolio and I want 10,000 um, euros of my, let's say, 50,000 um, in real estate, but not just an A, I couldn't get uh, any real estate as of today for 10,000 euros. And um, B, if I were to invest in a fund, I don't have a say in what I invest. Now with tokenization of real estate, I could easily say um, I want to invest 2,000 euros in the Taunus Tourum, which is one of the skyscrapers in um, Frankfurt. Maybe I want some industrial um, real estate in Berlin and whatever, right? Um, because now a lot of people can hold um, participation rights or um, yeah, participation rights in, in, one, um, in one real estate. And for example, that could be the right to receive a rent um, and uh, a value share when the real estate would be sold. Um, now coming back to, to private house owners, um, I think uh, studies say somewhere between 50 to 80 percent of the uh, of most uh, households' money or value is in their real estate, the one they are living in. And um, now I guess it's it's a difficult question if a more liquid market of private property or um, households is a good thing. But the possibility, at least, um, I think, uh, is, is really exciting. And to give people the freedom to decide if they 
um, want to tokenize uh, parts of their real estate, for example, to get liquidity or not. Um, and this is RTX 21. There's a lot of other uh, companies. And um, I think this will be the largest tokenization use case that we will see in the next years. Actually, together with uh, Benjamin, who opened this webinar, um, we did a small study and concluded that we will see um, really billions of tokenized uh, real, real estate or, yeah, mostly real estate assets in the future. And there's already, I mean, now this sounds like a big number, right? Because you don't read about it. Um, uh, and tokenization really feels small in Germany, but um, there's already uh, companies like Cashlink or RTX21 um, and their competitors uh, that tokenized um, many millions or even billions already. So this is really something to watch out for. And uh, I think one of the, for me, the most exciting part about um, blockchain. Um, now payments, I want to touch that uh, briefly. I think information we will skip. Um, payments, uh, Paper Chain is a project that we um, currently consult with the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center. Azos is more um, friends. We had a huge conference, I think 2019 together. And um, what both of them do, they use the euro on the blockchain. So why would you want to do that? Why do I need um, a digital euro? Or uh, um, let's phrase it differently. Um, do we already have a digital euro? And the answer is yes, right? If you look at your bank account, um, if you do online banking, this is digital money. Um, but bringing this money on the blockchain uh, does something different. Um, it enables smart contracts. Some of the buzzwords I haven't talked about, but which is really important. A smart contract, more or less, um, can break any business logic into an if-then statement or function, meaning um, in case of paper chain, uh, this is a manufacturer of um, machines and um, it looks at machine leasing and uh, wants to solve one problem um, or make leasing more flexible so that the leasee pays as soon um, as he uses the machine. And so this is your if, sta if then statement, right? Um, if product um, produced, pay amount X. And um, these smart contracts really are extremely simple. You can bloat them up a lot um, and make them extremely complex as well. But you can see with this example, um, you already have automation and new business models as well, because now you can um, easily you offer something like uh, flexible leasing. Um, I'm not saying that this is exactly what they do, um, but just in theory, uh, you could say usually um, you lease a machine for 20,000 euros a month. Now it's just 10. But um, when times are bad, you don't produce much. You maybe only pay 12,000. Um, if times are good and you produce a lot, uh, you pay 30,000, so a lot more. But um, for the leasee, um, it reduces the downside risk um, with some, um, yeah, with a little less revenue um, when it goes really good. And for the um, manufacturer of these machines, um, it can really open uh, new markets and opportunities because uh, the producer can now be really sure that he will receive payments if the machine is used and can also offer these machines to um, a more competitive rate and maybe get new customers through that. Um, and Azos does something, I would say, even more crazy. They take three components. Um, <clears throat> they take uh, the, or they bring the euro on uh, blockchain technology with themselves. They produce um, sensors and they provide the blockchain. And what they do, they um, install sensors in um, chemical silos, let's say um, oil. And uh, this is um, something called or most used for vendor managed inventories. So let's say um, I sell oil to BASF, right? The huge uh, chemical uh, uh, firm. And I have my silo on their ground and they only pay me as soon as they um, take out oil. And in the meantime, or no, no, in the, in the past, this is the right word, in the past, um, this was a somewhat manual process, um, maybe not true for Germany, but for a lot of other countries, um, it's also a process where they rely on really outdated tech. And when I say outdated tech, um, I talk about sensors that only work on Windows, on the DOS of Windows. 
Um, so years old. Oh, sorry, someone ringing the bell. I have to ignore that. Um, and so what they do is um, they provide really transparent, secure data um, of how much, um, let's say, oil or whatever resource was taken. They um, enable automated payments through the smart contracts as well. And um, this, this automated payment, the um, automated invoice issuance and so on, um, will affect a lot of other players and functions in all of these companies. So for, the, uh, for me providing the oil, um, everything will go easy. Um, I will have instant access to factoring, for example, because now we have um, high data quality, um, data quality high enough for banks to say, all right, um, this, is, uh, this data is created on a blockchain, we trust it, and um, we will offer factoring to these and that conditions. Um, a lot of that stuff can be automated, all the invoicing, the accounting um, can be automated, It will the better data quality will affect controlling. So you can see that um, putting sensors in a silo, which has been done before, and connecting that to a blockchain and also enable that, um, on top to um, um, execute the transactions will, it's somewhat simple, the idea, it's just three things that you change, um, but it will affect companies by a lot. It will save them um, a lot of money. It will reduce the cost. It um, gives the, the seller um, better access to liquidity, um, affects their working capital management, and so on and so forth. So this is one use case in the paper chain. You can go deeper into that as well. Um, these use cases uh, are really not too hard to understand. If you look at their website, maybe I was a bit too fast. If you look at their website, I think you can understand it um, within some minutes. Um, it's really straightforward, but if you think about it a little more, you will see how much these ideas um, can change um, business models, companies in the future. And maybe some last words um, about Marco Polo, because here I think you will see and um, probably also agree that we will see the most drastic change. Um, Marco Polo, I called it information, I could have called it trade finance, um, is a consortium of a lot of banks. Um, I think this involves also the, uh, I think Commerzbank, um, Erste Group and stuff like that. Um, so a lot of German or German speaking um, companies as well. And what they want to do is create a blockchain um, that makes trade finance uh, more efficient. So the financing of trades, which is often the international business and um, in a low trust environment. And um, really, I think what they do, and this is right, I can only observe all of these projects. I'm not involved in them. Um, but what I observe is what they try to do is really in the first step dig digitalize information or data because right now for trade finance um some banks have competitions who has the most paperwork for one deal and it can be a lot of paper because everyone has to sign it and sometimes it can even take up to four weeks just to get the contract signed um because it's so international and when we go back to our um, mailbox um, it's it's done by mail and so really digitalization um, in a lot of these companies unfortunately means you have a paper, you sign the paper, um, you scan it, you have a PDF, someone else gets the PDF, prints it out, signs it again, scans it in. Um, and so they want to change that um, and they were able to change it as well. So now these, um, these processes will maybe take uh, six hours, maybe two days, but it's a lot faster. But this is just the beginning, right? Um, with all the information across the supply chain that they get, this can change um, how insurance works because insurance now has more data and reliable data. Um, it changes uh, how banks can offer their services because they also have more data. They have better risk management. Um, it reduces the cost for them. So it makes it more profitable, but also they could give these cost reductions to the customers and maybe now trade finance is something um, that even small companies could do. So for banks, this can create new business. Now on the, um, if you take it the other way around, um, I sincerely believe uh, banks that don't use blockchain for trade finance um, in five to 10 years will, and I think this is a quite uh, pessimistic view, in five to 10 years latest, 
they will lose massive amounts of the trade finance business um, and maybe uh, really be reduced to a niche um, that that's not uh, easily automated. Um, and the rest will be heavily affected. Uh, maybe banks don't even make more money with it um, because th they have to compete with prices. Um, but I think this is not about blockchain technology, um, you know, being the Hail Mary and bringing you a lot of new money. It's more like using it to retain your business. And I think this is something um, that is true. Um, blockchain will not just um, render companies obsolete. It will not change the financial sector by, um, to, by tomorrow. Um, it will not uh, get rid of all the intermediaries, maybe of some. I think mostly roles will change. Um, but I think all the players, be it in the financial industry or in others, um, at least have to look at the technology, see what others are doing, and ask them, am I missing a trend that I should be part of? And at least be ready, you know, when something like Marco Polo really goes into production and you have trade finance, at least be ready at that point to say, all right, I missed it. Um, now I will take some fee, uh, pay some fee and uh, jump um, on it um, a little late, but better, you know, um, late than never. All right. Um, this is it. Um, sorry, I think it took a little longer than expected. Um, but I, I didn't want to skip through these uh, practical examples too much. And I think with that, maybe let's uh, take some more questions and I will end my screen share here. All right, thank you, Stefan. So now we have some more time for um, a Q&A session and um, I will moderate the questions. So please, if you have questions, just uh, raise them and write them in the chat box. And then we will try our best to provide some to provide some answers. So the first one is um, from Marco. He says that he doesn't understand why smart contracts are always mentioned um, as one of the great advantages. Mm, yes, um, I see. Uh, if he further says um, a permanent order is for my understanding nothing more as a smart contract. Um, I guess that's true. Um, maybe I see your question was um, from 20 minutes ago. I don't even know. I think I haven't been at the um, practical examples by then. I hope that my example with um, especially the machines um, maybe gave you some more insights into that. Um, I believe, as you said, for simple transactions, um, I think, yeah, it's not something that hasn't been done before. Um, I can have a permanent order in my bank account as of today. Um, this is nothing new. I think um, what is really cool is to to have it um, bound to conditions. Um, when it comes to machines, um, it might be able to enable really machine-to-machine -machine payments. Um, it might not be able to, as you ask for the lawyers, to um, replace everything but I think all the stuff you can um, put into uh, rules um, can be automated. And I guess at that point, um, maybe we don't talk about blockchain anymore, um, but more about machine learning and AI. Because I guess stuff like um, replace manual work from lawyers, um, uh, maybe not for negotiating conditions, but more for um, um, going through stuff is really limited by how um, the much um, AI evolves. And um, yeah, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not really too much into that. I think this may be something I've missed out as well. I think convergence of technologies is really important. Um, blockchain on its own uh, is a cool thing that might be useful on its own for some of the use cases, but I think for a lot of use cases, it's really strongest um, combined with other technologies. Um, I hope that helped a little, but uh, I totally understand. Um, and I think it's, it's good to be critical um, because, and this is something I can only uh, tell all of you to do um, all the time, um, just because something has blockchain in it, it's not automatically better. And um, always, I talked about architecture of blockchains a little, always think about um, does the blockchain um, really bring some extra value here? Or for example, for um, just permanent orders, is it something we have done before? We can do it now on a blockchain, but does it really help? <clears throat> now to the next question. Uh, Benjamin, I will just read it out myself, okay? Okay, as you like. 
Perfect. Okay. Regarding consensus, uh, Dominic uh, asks, um, the, regarding consensus, what happens if four or five nodes validate a transaction but the fifth one um, explicitly doesn't? Is it a simple majority vote? Um, this question uh, is hard to answer. Um, I would say in most cases, yes. When you look at Bitcoin, you have um, a proof of work consensus mechanism. Um, here I would say yes. Um, and I would also say, however, I have to, to admit I'm more into enterprise applications of blockchain and less into um, really protocol fundamentals myself. Um, there are some other um, consensus mechanisms. And if you were um, one of the, let's say, five participants and you act with malintent, you might even get punished or um, thrown out of the network. So <clears throat> and sometimes um, just nothing will happen, right? It's a majority vote and people will say, all right, 80% uh, voted for it. Um, that's done. Um, or 80% belief and, you know, one... A truth and just 20% in the other, then they can fork. There could be, um, you know, two um, parallel blockchains existing, one believing in that uh, truth and the other in the other. But, um, you know, as, as it's transparent, um, most people will move to the blockchain that has acted uh, uh, rightfully. Mm. But it's uh, something you can look at. Um, for other protocols, they have um, other consensus mechanisms. And... Um, while a set security of blockchain is uh, somewhat attached to the computing power and the energy consumption, um, security of other protocols isn't. And they implemented ways to make sure to get rid of nodes um, with bad intent. So next question by Frederick. Um, how should blockchain be regulated by state? There is a reason why you're not able to transfer money from Iran to Europe just like that. Um, <clears throat> And I think I read a similar question. Let me, as there come more now, I will have to get rid of some. Um, I will combine it with, if a blockchain is not traceable, aside from the participants of the network, wouldn't it be possible to use it for legal purposes? Uh, E.g. money laundering, avoiding taxes, selling a house, um, stuff like that. I think um, these two questions go well together. Um, personally, I feel... Um, I lack the knowledge how regulation works in this financial sphere um, in detail. However, Frederick, I agree with you. Um, there are reasons um, that are in place why it's not too easy to transfer money, um, especially not from person to person, maybe from bank to bank, um, and then it gets checked, but not from person to person. Um, let's take a step back. When Bitcoin first uh, came out, um, I think it was uh, yeah the most popular payment method for what was it called um, the the dark web website where you could almost buy everything, be it drugs or weapons or fake passports or whatever. So um, in short, it was like a dirty currency, um, one that criminals would use because you can trace it, um, etc. What I can say personally, I'm really critical um, towards uh, cryptocurrencies. I don't really see um, a reason why I should use one, at least as a European here. Um, and I think for projects to work, like projects like Libra, right, that have the goal to be a, a somewhat of a global currency, um, they need to um, be in line with the laws that we have today or maybe the laws that we have to have in the future for a global currency. Um, <clears throat> and what that means, um, because uh, some uh, anonymous uh, viewer uh, said it's not traceable, um, this is not true. Um, whoever claims that Bitcoin is uh, truly um, anonymous um, is wrong. It's more like pseudonymous because you have um, A, you have like an account number. As soon as someone... Um, finds out who's behind that account um, it's you know you know who it is and second um, how do you get bitcoin now you can mine it just using bitcoin for the example right because most know it you can mine it or you can buy it but um, if you want to buy it you need um, to use exchanges as let's say uh, off uh, on ramp and these exchanges are heavily regulated um, already um, and they do all the KYC and AML stuff because um, a lot of crypto startups back in the day had the problem. They raised, let's say, 50 million 
mm, and they could not cash it out because their bank said, all right, I don't know what the, the threshold is. I think like five or 10,000. Um, they said, all right, um, I want the, the history. Where does the money came from? And if you don't know who exactly bought it, um, you know, you don't get it through the anti-money laundering and stuff. So already we see um, some regulation. The exchanges know exactly um, who they are dealing with. So this is not anonymous at all. Um, it's not really decentralized at all as well. Um, it's super centralized. Um, and I think there's value in bringing um, currencies on the blockchain, as I already said. Um, and uh, I also believe that to... Um, to make your euro a, a Libra coin, a Bitcoin, whatever. Um, in the future, you will need some regulated on-ramp that knows who you are, um, that knows your identity, um, to give this transparency, as you said, for the anti-money laundering, um, etc. I hope this answers the question. So, um, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I cannot tell you um, how exactly to regulate it. Um, I think probably regulation by one state isn't enough. Um, maybe there has at least to be a, um, a European-wide um, idea how to do it. I think this is what they do as well. Um, but as said, I believe the um, to be really used in the future, uh, everything has to apply to the same, same standards more or less than it does today. Otherwise, it won't work. Okay, let me see. Um, now I come to Algar's question. Will everyone adopt blockchain in their supply chain in future? Um, hard to say, I would say no. <laughs> I think this is a safe bet. No, not everyone will use it, but um, I guess uh, it, it can make sense. Um, it depends on why you want to use it. Um, for example, we said that um, for trade finance, it might be useful. Um, we talked to a big uh, <clears throat> tax company, so one of the top 30 in, in Germany. They think about it because they want um, certificates on a blockchain. So for them, it's more um, like gaining more trust um, of their customers as they can now prove um, some things um, to 100% for um, producers of food and beverages it might be nice <clears throat> because uh, if one of their products is um, i don't know one of the cows was sick and um, it has to get removed they don't have to remove it um, from all of the country but they can track it perfectly um, i think there's a lot of supply chain applications for blockchain um, I believe first question everyone has to ask, um, does it make sense in my business model? Then second, um, do I need blockchain for it? And I think um, in a lot of um, yeah, uh, applications, the answer will be both a yes. And so we will see something, but I, I think it, it slowly develops. Um, what is the most disruptive enabling project in a sense that could result in revolutionize its industry you can think of? Hmm. It's hard to say, really. Um, I before think, you think uh, too long, <laughs> hmm? I, before you think too long, I could just uh, jump in there and say, yes, for me personally, for example, it's, it's, it's a Libra project because um, um, you see so much projects all over the world, uh, brilliant projects, maybe even more revolutionizing projects than Libra, but what Facebook or Libra has is just a customer base, no project, uh, prior already had you know they will have like maybe two two billions of potential clients and this is what makes the whole difference for me because as i said we have so many good projects but they are lacking to onboard customers and this is where i could really imagine that um, even if facebook or libra has a very small conversion rate so people really using libra this will still be probably hundreds of millions of users Yeah, I, I can only agree. I think Libra is really ambitious. And as you said, I think it's in the media as much as it is, um, just because this could be the first real um, blockchain application um, that is big. You know, uh, all these startups have to gain the trust of their um, potential customers and start really small. Um, and as Benjamin said, Libra could start potentially with um, 2 billion people right at the start. And um, Philip Sandner, 
um, our boss actually wrote, uh, I think, at least one article about it, um, talking about how uh, a cryptocurrency, let's say, like Libra, could affect um, the financial system worldwide. And I mean, bringing, let's say, maybe 500 million people onto a new payment platform, making them use a new currency, could really have huge effect. Um, and now, a last question for today by Kirsten. Um, what is the difference between cryptocurrencies and other forms of digital payments, e.g. transfer between PayPal accounts? Um, I think this is really interesting because uh, a lot of people um, or a lot of the Euro on blockchain projects do exactly what PayPal does at the moment. So um, what PayPal does is, um, you know, you have a bank account, you have an IBAN, um, and uh, they have one and they have a so-called omnibus account where they store all the money. I think it's in, in France. I'm not quite sure, at least for Europe. And so <clears throat> they use a database. You send the money, the money is on their account and they send it more or less like a token, like a cryptocurrency token. Um, they send it to um, someone else, you see it on your phone and you know your balance is 110 euros, but the money is not on your account, right? It's on their account and it's a database entry. And if you send this money to someone else, um, they just change the database. And this is um, why they can do it for really low cost. There's no transaction cost because the money, um, as long as it's not paid out, just resides on their one account. <clears throat> and um, this is what the today's Euro on, on blockchain projects do as well. Um, instead of uh, showing you the balance on their app, um, they use a token um, that gives you the right against the bank for payout and um, they don't use a traditional database, but a blockchain um, to, to break it down. Um, the difference between cryptocurrencies and other forms of digital payments, I would say, um, is the regulation aspect. Um, and this is why these zero on blockchain projects are really interesting as well. When you go back some years, you will see that a lot of um, also the big German companies did their blockchain proof of concepts. They had ideas how they, um, I don't know, I think share and charge was one that you can um, charge your cars and pay with cryptocurrencies and it works. You have it um, for energy sectors, payments um, with Ethereum and it works. And a lot of stuff like that. Now this has two problems. Um, a, uh, most people that have electric car um, don't really want to care or don't care too much about Ethereum. So they won't use it. It's uh, not convenient for the user. And it's maybe even less convenient for the company because then they will have some cryptocurrency on their balance sheet and maybe don't really know what to do about it um, from an accounting point of view, from a taxation point of view. Um, it's really not that regulated um, yet. So I think it's, it's not a ground that people want to be in. And um, I think this is one of the reasons why a lot of working proof of concepts were never um, brought to reality because the currency to, to really use it wasn't there. And so um, I think this is part of the answer. Um, cryptocurrencies, they have a bad reputation. Um, they are unregulated um, to some degree. Um, it changes a little, but... Uh, I think um, when you look at adoption, um, people are really hesitant, especially companies using um, cryptocurrencies. And so um, what I want to make uh, clear, uh, I showed you the use case um, of Marco Polo before um, and how they uh, not really focus on the payment aspect as of now, but really on digitizing information. And this is a use case where you can um, use blockchain without payments. But, you know, integrating the payments through smart contracts um, makes, it, makes all the use cases a little nicer, a little more sexy, gives you a little more cost savings, more efficiency, and so on. Um, yeah. Uh, and I think um, as well, when you look at cryptocurrencies, um, you want several things from your blockchain protocol. First, you want that your... Um, Cryptocurrency is not really volatile, so more or less stable. Um, we have the so-called stable coins, for example, that look at the US dollar. Um, I think others are not really useful, at least not for us, you know, because we have really stable currencies here in Europe. Maybe if you live somewhere um, in South America, the Bitcoin's volatility might not be too bad for you. I don't know. Um, 
The second would be that the transactions costs are really low, that the scalability is high so that you can have a lot of transactions and um, yeah, security in general. And I think um, this is not, uh, most cryptocurrencies don't get it right at the moment. So this is why I said I'm, I'm really critical because I don't see the uh, imminent need at the moment. And I also believe that the ECB um, bringing Euro on a blockchain would be um, far more beneficial because it would enable these use cases. But um, yeah, with the money we already know. Um, however, I see that in some countries and for some use cases, there's, there's um, a good reason to have cryptocurrencies. I'm, I'm, I'm not totally against it, but this is uh, what I have to say to this question. And now really the last question for Chris. Um, I thought that there were numerous challenges related to the Libra project. You seem to be positive that Libra will uh, materialize. Any info on that? Um, <clears throat> maybe Benjamin can jump in uh, soon, but uh, first thing, um, I mean, they have a lot of power behind it. Um, I think it's really hard to tell if it will be successful or not. Um, but as things stand, I think they really have the opportunity to to get it going. Um, what I was surprised about is that they came forward with it. Um, I mean, they can implement payments into their messenger and everything really easily. Um, I think Facebook has, I don't know how many, a lot of licenses when it comes to um, payments, financial stuff. Um, but I was surprised that it's not Amazon coming forward with an idea like that because they could probably use it internally really good. They have millions of um, shops onboarded already and could really have a, a digital currency that can be used you know worldwide from day one but uh, now benjamin maybe you can answer this question better no I, I totally agree for me it's pretty much just the same thing because uh, i mean the libra consortium they have pretty much unlimited resources and i think that most of the projects who won't make it or can't make it, it's because they somehow lack resources. And this is someone, somewhat uh, where Libra will not fail. And yes, they have a lot of challenges and, and there will be probably even more challenges coming or, or just other challenges. But um, I mean, um, I, I personally think that um, they are just uh, deemed to make it. And if they can't make it uh, work, then um, I, I guess, uh, we won't see any big projects going through. So um, I think when you look at uh, Europe, for example, you see more and more countries being very open and positive to blockchain technology. And um, I think that they will find solutions to make it work. So uh, yeah, thank you for uh, joining and participating in our webinar. I have one just last hint for you. Um, after you uh, leave the webinar, you will be redirected to a website and there you can literally take three clicks and rate the webinar, which would be very, very important for us. So yes, thank you again and take care. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you for joining.